Hello and welcome to season 10 of the Meaning Movement Podcast. If you're watching this, if you're hearing my voice, this is the culmination of a ton of work that my team and I have been doing over the past few months to get ready, to get prepared to 4X our production with this podcast. You may have heard me talk about before how important the Meaning Movement is to me personally and how much I've wanted to see it to go, go to new places and how I'm kind of just throwing everything at the wall, see what sticks, kind of blowing it up to see what's going to happen. And this episode and this season of the next couple of months of doing two episodes per week is a piece of that process for me. So I'm so excited to be here with you to be doing this together. So welcome to season 10. Catherine Finney is an investor, visionary entrepreneur, philanthropist and startup champion. She is the founder and managing general partner of Genius Guild and author of Build the Damn Thing, How to Start a Successful Business Even If You're Not a Rich White Guy, a fantastic book that really pushes back against the typical VC Silicon Valley culture that favors rich white men. She is the chair of the Dooney Fund and founder and former CEO of Digital Undivided, a social enterprise focused on creating a world where black women own their work. She also founded the Budget Fashionista and became one of the first black women to have a successful seven-figure startup exit when she sold that business. Interestingly, separate from all of this, she's a Yale-trained epidemiologist, a word that I have a hard time saying. Her work has been recognized by the Aspen Institute Entrepreneur Magazine, Marie Claire Ebony Inc., just all kinds of great publications around the web and offline, both on and offline. She was just really fun to talk with. We explored her journey and many twists and turns that she's taken along the way and her specialty of this subject matter of her most recent book, which is the obstacles that women and particularly women of color have to overcome in order to build successful businesses. It was a great conversation. I had a blast. I think you'll enjoy this one as much as I do. This, of course, is the Meaning Movement Podcast. It's a show about work worth doing, helping you level up your life, your mindset, your income, find more meaning, purpose, success, fulfillment in any of the things, all of the things that you are chasing after in life. So if all that sounds good to you, you're in the right place. Today with guest Catherine Finney, stay with us. This episode, like all episodes of the Meaning Movement podcast, is made possible by The Common Course. I just want to say, what, what do I mean by that when I say made possible? It sounds like something that they say in Sesame Street at the beginning or the end. My kids love Sesame Street. What I mean by that is this is a bootstrapped project. I have a course called The Common Course. It's what I consider the cornerstone or, or flagship offering of the Meaning Movement. That course is all about work, all about purpose, all about navigating this space of these questions of who am I, what is my life about, where am I going, what's my contribution going to be, whether that's right now, in the future, whatever it might be. This podcast has expenses. We pay for those expenses via sales of that calling course, also through sponsorships. I'll share a little bit more about in just a moment. But I wanted to just, instead of talking about the calling course here today, wanted to share some words from a recent member of the course. This is Ryan. He sent this over and gave me permission to share this with you. So I'm going to read from him his thoughts on being a part of the calling course. He says, discovering more of who I am and how that connects to the world in work is an overwhelming process. It can be hard to know where to start and easy to feel stuck. The meaning movement has been a great acceleration, affirmation, and help in this to me. The Calling Course specifically offered new perspectives and a deeper invitation into who I am and how I can walk the path to becoming my fullest self, connected to others in a mission through work. I love that so much. The combination of material, questions, and direct coaching through Q&A is powerful. I recommend it to anyone doing the hard work of walking deeper into their call. First, thank you so much, Ryan, for those words. They are just so fantastic. And I couldn't have said it better myself, which is why I'm reading them here. If you're listening or watching and you want to know more about the calling course, the course I open up for enrollment periodically 
I don't have a set schedule at this time, but the best way to know when it's going to be the next enrollment period is going to be opening is for you to be on the email list. You can get on the email list anywhere at the meaningmovement.com. You'll find a bunch of subscribe boxes around the site or go to the calling course, the calling course.com. There is a free mini course. It gives just a small taste of what the calling course is all about. If you join that mini course, you'll be sure to be on the list for our next enrollment. So if any of that sounds exciting and enticing to you, make sure to jump on the email list and then you'll be notified when that next enrollment period opens. I just want to take a quick moment to talk about sponsorship. I've always said that this this podcast, this endeavor is made possible by the calling course. What that means is it's self-funded, it's bootstrapped, but we are opening the door to sponsors to come alongside us if they're a good fit for our audience. So if you have a business, a service, or work for someone who does that would like to get in front of an audience like ours, shoot us an email at podcast at themeaningmovement.com. We can tell you more about what we have to offer by way of our audience and sponsorship opportunities, and we can take the conversation from there. Podcast at themeaningmovement.com. Thanks so much. Catherine, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome to the Meaning Movement Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. The question I'd like to begin with is, how do you begin to talk about the work that you do in the world? You know, I always start with that I have the best job in the world. I get to invest in people who are like me, who look like me. I get to be a part of a creative process, not just for myself, but for others as well. And that is so gratifying. Um, it, it's so exciting. It's nothing like seeing things being built. And we're at a time period in our world right now where things are not being built, right? Things are kind of being destroyed a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and so to be a part of a process and to everyday work and get paid to be a part of a process in which people are building things and not destroying things, it's pretty exciting. It's a pretty cool job. I love it. I love it. So just to kind of fill that out a little bit further, uh, I mean, I, I, I know a little bit, uh, but for <laughs> listeners, is that, does that mean that you're a venture, you know, in venture capital or like, what does it mean that you're investing in, in, um, in companies and in people? You know, I often say my occupation is venture capital, but my vocation is entrepreneurship. Mm. And so I, I invest in amazing women of color founders, mostly, um, who are building high growth companies. Um, and there are companies that are doing interesting, cool things. Like um, one of my favorite companies that we invested in is called Health and Her Hue. It's like WebMD for Black women, which is like mm. amazing and scaling and it's growing really rapidly. Another one of our companies is a company called Quirk Chat, which is a sort of TikTok for quirky people of color. Um, and so all yeah. of these communities, all these things that are being built with just exceptionally creative founders, like I get to fund them. I get to support them. I get to invest in them and then work with them to grow their companies. I love it. Well, let me just rewind a little bit because I, I don't, well, my, the, the bit I know about your story is that you, you didn't take the conventional path no. into <laughs> venture, venture capital. And so I'd love to hear some of, some of that story. Cause you, you started your career as I believe an epi epidemic, I can't even say the word. An epidemiologist. epidemiologist. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and so how did you how did you go from there to here and just just maybe fill in some of the, yeah, fill in some of those gaps? You know, I really kind of fell into things. Um, I always believe in like going where the opportunities follow and so and not feeling that I have to be in a rigid box. And so yeah. I had a sick parent. I was living abroad working as an epidemiologist and had to come back to the States. And I got married and I was spending so much money because I was just depressed. So like shopping was like my, my therapy. Um, it was yeah. a very expensive therapy, but, um, <laughs> and my husband at the time said, you know, why don't you start a blog instead of spending all this money? Like, why don't you just write about shopping and you can kind of pretend like you were doing it. And yeah. so I started this blog and it became a thing. Um, and this was in 2003 and it was all about budget shopping. And that was before everyone had to budget shop. Um, if we remember, this is before 2008, things are really, really good. I think we're kind of in a similar period now, before yes. now, everything is really, <laughs> really good. And then all of a sudden everyone had to be on the budget and everyone sort of mm. cared. And so my, my website turned into a media company that I later mm. sold. And then I went to go work for another woman led startup and that got bought. And while at that startup, I started an organization called digital undivided. 
um, which is an organization that works with Black and Latinx women to help them scale and grow their companies. Um, and it's now a massive sort of institution, but I started it, ran it for eight years, and it was during the pandemic um, that I started to see really the challenges around sort of finance and equity and investment for women of color. For many years, Digital Divided had did a um, research project called Project Diane, where we documented the lack of uh, investment for Black women and Latinx women. Um, at one point, the percentage of investment Black women had received was 0 0.006 of all percent of all venture capital. We're about 7% wow. of the U.S. population. So wow. you can imagine, statistically, we, got, we had no investment. Um, yeah. And that had a big impact on me. And mm -hmm. so I said, okay. Um, and then during the pandemic, I had a front row seat to see how uh, people of color, women, um, basically anyone who didn't have a personal banker weren't getting that first tranche of the PPP loans. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just devastating. And so I started a nonprofit called the Dooney Fund that gives micro investments. Um, and we gave out over 1,500 micro investments in a six week time period during the mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and it changed my life doing that. Wow. Um, and each year we give out a, a, a certain amount of money each year. It's my primary philanthropy. But um, it just fundamentally changed my life of just being able to do that. And this whole thought of investing in women of color without a bunch of unnecessary restrictions that have nothing to do with their capability, but everything to do with um, societal beliefs in terms of what this group of people could do. Mm. And so that just had a huge impact on me. And while I was trying to think of what my next steps were going to be post-digital and divided, George Floyd was murdered. Um, mm. And I grew up in Minneapolis. I went to elementary school about six blocks away from where he was murdered. So. Wow. And I knew so many people who were involved. Like I know the prosecutors, is our family hairdressers, like husband. I mean, it's just that sort of like uh, connection, yeah, right? Of these yeah. people who I grew up with or I knew personally. And it just that coupled with the impact of the Dooney Fund just really led me to start Genius Guild. It was a, a catalyst of I can do this. I can invest in people like myself. Um, we have ideas. We have we're building scalable companies um, and that we can, we can do this and I can do this. I love it. I love it so much. Um, I mean, so much of your story, I feel like is, is you seeing opportunity, taking a step towards it and then maybe holding open hands to, you know, receive or to find what, what might come and, and accept, you know, the, the next step, the next yeah. journey, the next doorway that, that, that opens in front of you. As you think back on, on all those transitions, like when you were an epidemiologist like that, I mean, that takes a lot of, a lot of schooling, a lot of education mm -hmm. to, to get, to get there. Right. Yeah. Um, and then to pivot from that, like, it just seems like I, I, I'm just, I guess, so just taken aback by how much you've been able to reinvent yourself and continue to do so. And now, you know, of course, reinventing, you know, a whole, a whole industry, right, of, <laughs> of, of venture capital. Um, but have you, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question is here, except like, yeah, have you always felt like, like a change in adapting to your environment? Is that like something that's just is really natural to you? Or, or is it like yeah. skills that you've learned along the way? I think, you know, I grew up with a family that took a big risk. My parents left Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we knew everyone and moved to Minneapolis, where we knew absolutely no one. Yeah. And I saw them take that risk and I saw them win. And as mm -hmm. a result, I knew that I could also take that risk too. And growing up yeah. in Minneapolis, I was often like to say the only little chocolate drop in um, <laughs> a room full of people who were not like me. Yeah. And so if I wanted to have a date um, during high school, I had to learn how to interact with other people yeah. who weren't like me. Mm -hmm. um, and that has served me quite well in my life. And so I could yeah. go to any situation and pretty much talk to anyone. My yeah. friends call me the Rose Nyland from like Golden Girls, the Betty White character. Uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. I always have a story and I can pretty much go to like anywhere and talk to anyone. And I have done yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, as you, um, I know you already used the word vocation, but I kind of want to circle, circle back to that because I think it's, um, it's a, it's a important, important word to me. It's a word I often 
you know, I'm trying to move the needle on that word, you know, in, mm-hmm. in, in culture to get people thinking about like how, how they think about calling vocation in their lives. Yep. How would you articulate your, and you already have started, started on that, but how do you think about that word? How do you use that in your vernacular? You know, I think a vocation of it's who I am mm. at yeah. the end of the day. That's a great and occupation is what I do on a daily yeah. basis, but that's not necessarily yeah. who I am. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, we're not really giving language to talk like that of like, you know, I'm an accountant. Well, that you, you, now loving numbers is, is your vocation, right? Maybe, yeah. maybe you're a numbers person, a mathematician. Maybe that's yeah. your vocation. And what yeah. you do, how you apply it is as an accountant, as your occupation. Yep. And I think if mm. you think of it in that way of your vocation is who you are, and your occupation is how you apply who you are. Yes. Um, it just helps keep it very clear the difference between the two. Yeah, yeah. It is so, so well said. And I, I mean, very much in line with how I think about it. Like that a dream job at, at its best should be an outlet for your for your vocation, for who you are. But it is not, you know, it is not your vocation. It's it's a place, it's a place to do that work, but it isn't your work in and of itself. Exactly. Um, which which I think you've you've articulated. Yeah. So 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 beautifully. So thank you. Thank you for that. I want to talk about this book, Build the Damn Thing. I, 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 don't, I, don't, you know, I don't usually cuss. I you know that, yeah. that that's a mild my word. Son. It feels weird coming have, out of my yeah. mouth. But, <laughs> I have a six-year-old and I gave him permission to say the title and now he like says it over and over again because he never gets to say anything, but like. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you dedicated the book to him, I noticed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is just so sweet. So sweet. Um, how to start a successful business, even if you're not a rich white guy. I mean, you've already started talking about where this book came from, but when did it become a book in your mind and what is your hope for the book? You know, it became a book just through the years of, building things and reading all the business books, some of which are some of my favorite books, but they never addressed the challenges that I face as, as a mom. That's a whole slew of challenges there of managing that Um, as, as a woman, as a black woman, um, as someone who isn't, you know, super wealthy. I I do think I'm definitely privileged. It, It just wasn't written for, people like me um, and wasn't written for most of us actually. And yeah. so how do you handle that? How do you build a business when there's so many strikes against you? How do you build a business where you're playing on a different playing field? You're playing a different yeah. game. You're yeah. playing on like a harder level, like expert level that you have to yes. navigate. And how do you do that? Like, how do you yes. actually do that when you don't have the privileges that are automatically given when you are male, white, and of a certain class. Mm. Um, and what was really, what's been really interesting about this book is like the number of rich white men who actually like the book. Yeah, <laughs> I, think that, I think that's so funny. I mean, one of our endorsers is you know Steve Case. He's like one of the OG like rich white guys. Yeah. And um, but the feedback that they've given me was this is similar to the advice that I give the companies I invest in, but I don't have the cultural competency to say it to them. And you said it in a way that people could actually hear. And me as a rich white guy, I say it and I mess it up and it doesn't sound right. And it comes off as a certain way, but you say it and people could hear it. Mm. And I thought that was like one of the most interesting compliments from, from a rich white guy. It wasn't written for them, but I'm glad that they're getting (laughs) um, value. It's written for everyone who gets value from it, but yes. But it was really this book of like, how do you build something when you don't have privilege? Yes. How yeah. do you do it? Yeah. Um, and it's not just women. It's not just, you know, women of color. But if you're part of the LGBTIQ community or if you didn't come from money um, and you're poor, like, how do you do this? How do you build something that's sustainable and lasts when you don't have all those advantages? Mm. I love it. And is it, I mean, I, I, I know, cause I've, um, I've read m- most of it as, as we said before I started, started um, recording. There's so many different ways to go about starting something, 
Um, which path, is there a specific path that you have in mind for this, this book, for people who are reading this book, as far as, you know, whether it's bootstrapping something like building a blog, like you did to like, you know, then selling as a, as a media company to like, you know, going to Silicon Valley and, and raising, raising funds. Like what, what path did you write with this with, um, in mind? The path I wrote it was really with first figuring out the path that's right for you. I, so many books I read were like so prescriptive of like, you do this, you do this, you do this. Um, and I start the book talking about what I call get your mind right, which is yes. basically get yourself in the position to be able to build because entrepreneurship is really hard. <laughs> um, it is a marathon, not a race. And mm -hmm. you have to build up endurance. You have to have this toolbox to be able to get through it because you're going to be challenged at every step of the way. Um, it's just the nature of it, whether it be ethically, whether it be financially, whether it be even in your personal relationships, you're going to be challenged as you start to do this. And so it is in your best interest to spend time centering yourself and getting yourself together before you embark on this path and this process. It is time well spent. Yeah, I love that. Um, really uh, just a, it's such a different focus. I felt than books that are you know, typically just like to just get, you know, get out there, put in the work, do the hustle, you know, yeah. grind it out. Um, which start you start with a different place, and I think by starting at a different place, you you end up with a more sustainable um, a sustainable approach, um, which I I thought was a really great uh, invitation. At the end of the day, we all want to live a creative life in which we can control. And entrepreneurship is literally just a tool to do that. It's it's not yeah. the end all, the be all. And so, and there's other tools that you can use as well. And I think if you think of entrepreneurship as a tool and not the end all, the be all, it helps keep you sort of in that process. Um, because again, it's it's a hard journey. It is not yeah. easy. It's you know people will often say entrepreneurs are maybe a little kooky because <laughs> who would choose to do the hardest thing in the entire world? Yes. Um, but it's so interesting. My, my ex-husband often says to me, you know, there's this gene that tells you not to jump. And he's like, you don't have that gene. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't totally. have the non-jumping gene. Like, yeah. um, and, and I think, you know, that's true for entrepreneurs. It's like, yeah. we're doing the hardest thing in the world, but we're doing it because now we have a creative life in which we can control. And that yeah. is worth it. That giving... Mm -hmm. Being able to control our lives and our destinies is worth giving up the, the stability and security of maybe working for someone else. I mean, that's why we do it. Yeah, I love that. And I, I love that the idea of entrepreneurship as a tool. That's just a reframing that I've never, I've never heard before. I, I usually think of entrepreneurship as an identity, as, mm. as something of, of, of who you are. Which I think is great in some ways, but then also can be really hard because there there might be times when you I'm, I'm speaking <laughs> speaking from my own story, uh, like I you try to be just try, try to start something and then it didn't work out that well. And so then what does that say about me mm. being an entrepreneur and am mm -hmm. I actually an entrepreneur? And I, I really love that invitation to to view it as a tool because it's just just like any tool, you can learn how to use it and yeah. learn how to how to you know. You learn how to use a shovel to, to, to dig a hole or, you know, a, a hammer to build a fence. And like in the same way, you can learn how to how to do how, how to use the tool of entrepreneurship. Um, and, and it's just more a more forgiving, um, I guess, metaphor. So thank you for that. That's uh, really, really fantastic. One of the ideas that really um, jumped out to me from the book that I felt like I really needed. I mean, there's so many in there. Um, I felt I did feel this like. Um, I don't know, like as I was reading it, like like you said about the the rich white guys. I don't, I'm not rich, but I am a white guy. Um, that I'm like, oh, is this is, is this book for me? Um, should I even be reading this? But felt like you know, you you are articulating, I think, putting your finger at a problem, um, the problem of of representation, the problem that you've already mentioned about that point zero zero six percent of funds going to to um, to black women, um, black companies founded by by black women and so like as i was reading it i was like at first i was like okay 
what's this journey what's this journey about to uh, that i'm about to take gonna be like um but quickly felt myself kind of settle into it and just um it was just a really fantastic and with so fantastic read with so many takeaways of all the different steps of the process of building something but one of the ideas just to circle back to it that um i just really spoke to me and i want to really put into to action is the idea of a personal advisory board mm -hmm. yeah like I, i've i've often you know heard of you know boards of directors and and advisory boards for companies uh but why don't you just kind of talk about that a little bit and what what your your vision for that is and how listeners can employ that in their own lives whether or not they're building something because i think it's a really important concept yeah i think your personal advisory board is something you should do whether you're building a company or not um, and it really is this idea of, you know, if you think of the advisory boards or board of directors you create for a company, right, and they're there to give advice, uh, many are very invested in the success of the company um, and, and give you advice, some, some leadership, some, some mapping for you. It's similar for your personal advisory board. These are people who are invested in you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have like an investor or your business, you know, your accountant or anyone like that. Um, it is the people for whom you winning is exciting for them. It's people who yeah. want to see you win. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of components to the personal advisory board. One is you want somebody who is your BS meter. Basically the person who can tell you when you are kind of lying to yourself, yeah. <laughs> when you're yeah. maybe not being honest to yourself and they can tell you in a way where you can hear it. Um, cause not everyone we can hear it from, but there's some people who can like cut right through it yes. and get to the bone and like really challenge you to make sure that you're like being honest to yourself and who you are. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also someone who's really good at kind of being the blocker for you and like handling like difficult people, especially when you come from large families or large communities. In my case, it's my mother who, um, has a particular skill set that she's honed over years to paraphrase the movie Taken. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, she's able to do it, deal with kooky family members yes. who, who come up. Um, you know, if you're in Forbes magazine raising this $20 million fund, you know, of course, there's family members who see that and think, oh, my gosh, Catherine has $20 million. Let me go ask her for money. And my mom is very good at saying no. And she's a, you know, a 75 year old black grandma. No one's going to go against her. Like, yes. <laughs> I mean, she's not especially tall, but like, you know, everyone's afraid to like go against her. So she can yeah. say no in the final. Yeah. Um, someone who makes you laugh. Yeah. You know, I always say on your board of directors, a comedian. In my case, it's my son. who's actually on my board of advisors. He is so funny. It's very hard to be upset about, you know, what's going on in the market when you have a six-year-old singing a song about people who live in the toilet. It is very, very <laughs> difficult to be <laughs> angry. And it just puts it all in perspective. And so, it, you know, you're really, your advisory board are the people who want to see you win and who are really there for you. And, yeah. and, and it's more of a personal thing, not so much about your business, but it impacts your business because these are the people for whom will give you the foundation, the people who will who you can talk to, the people who will help guide you. They don't have to be family members. They can be close friends or close mentors. But these are the people who you can be fully yourself with because when you're a CEO and you're leading, sometimes you can't be fully yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's many reasons why you can't, but with this advisory board, you can, and they appreciate and they uplift you. And that's so important. I love that. Um, yeah. It, it's such a such a good yeah i guess way to think about what your needs are how to bring the people around around you i'm curious do you do you recommend like is it formal like does does your mom know she's your blocker or does, <laughs> she does now you know? she read the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah but do you recommend people like or is it just like you have in the back of your head like okay if i need help in these different areas i go to these people or yeah. do you like you know have a have an intentional conversation like saying hey, i am trying this thing this personal advisory board, would you, would you have a seat on it? I don't know. How, how formal should it be? So, you know, for, in the case of my mother, I, you know, would say I have this thing coming out. There's a form article about me raising. This is what happened last year. And I just said, I just need you to like run interference for me. Mm, yeah. Um, and she, she got it Im immediately yeah. what that meant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
and so it's not like formal, like we have formal meetings once a quarter yeah. or anything like that. We take <laughs> notes. A, a boardroom. <laughs> In a boardroom. No, it's yeah. more like, hey, you know, I need you to run interference or, yeah. you know, let me stop working and like play with my son for a little bit and have him tell me some crazy story about toilet people or whomever, right? Or like his it. friends at school, which make no sense, but it's like so hilarious. Or, you know, um, I was taken to one person and they were saying their dog is on their advisory board because it's like anytime they're feeling super stressed and they have a decision to make, their dog comes around and it's just like instant happiness. Uh, so it doesn't have to be yeah. formal. Um, yeah. And and it doesn't even have to be, you know, a, a, a human being <laughs> in the yeah. case of, totally. but it's something that helps centers you. It's, it's groups of people who help center you, who help remind you of your greatness, remind you of who you are and why you're doing what you're doing um, so that you can then do the business. So you can then interact with your business board of directors, but it's, yes. it's those, that sort of foundation. And it's so important. I cannot tell you how valuable it's been for me in my life. It. Yeah. I love it so much. Um, yeah. It's definitely something that I, um, it, it's, it's related to a concept I've been thinking about, but I haven't, I haven't, really uh, had the right structure for. So it's definitely, you know, one of the takeaways that I personally will be, um, yeah, putting putting into place. Um, so thank you for that. You, you talk in the book about, um, you know, business models and, and creating an MVP. And um, I was really love just the, the process that you, you take the reader through of like validating ideas in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is something that um, is a really helpful process I mean, especially if you're going to be starting a business, your you know, product or a service that you're, you're dreaming about. But I think even outside of that, even for people who are listening, who are thinking about, you know, making a change in the in their, their lives or new career. Like, I think there's a lot of ways that like you could take we could take the MVP concept mm -hmm. and apply it to to a lot of different areas of life. But I'm curious uh, just to, to have you share just with with listeners you know, some of your thoughts on how to MVP, how to start when you have a big idea to know if that big idea is worth, you know, the, the investment um, of time and, and resources. Yeah. You know, I often suggest starting with as spending as little money as humanly possible. And what you want to do is you want to do what I call like a series of ugly baby tests. Um, and well, and ugly it, baby it comes, name. it's so good. <laughs> like, you know, we all think our baby's super cute. Um, all our, we all think our kids are like the most amazing children in the world yeah. they may not be cute to everyone and it's a similar mm -hmm. thing with ideas we think our ideas are like the best ideas that have ever existed in the history of ideas but yeah. maybe not everyone else thinks so and in the case of business you have to have other people think so right that's how yeah. you are actually a business you have to have other people see value in what it is that you're bring, building and it can be really hard to be out there like that to talk mm -hmm. about it like that, mm -hmm. um, to be really out front with that. Because this fear that if I share this, people are going to be negative towards me. If I share this, it's going to be, I'm going to get a response that's maybe not great or that I want to yeah. hear. But it's really important so that you don't waste your time and money going down this road with an ugly baby. Um, yes. And so one of the things I suggest in entrepreneurship is just doing some basic testing. But you can also do this in terms of your career, too, which is, um, you know, going on like Twitter. Twitter is the world's customer service engine um, and going on there, uh, taking the topic of either the company you, you want to work for or work with or what you're trying to build, the industry that you're going into and just do a search and see what people are saying on Twitter about it. Is there a lot of conversations? Yeah. Are people complaining about the particular thing that your product is solving? You know, that helps you see that this, this is a pain point for people. People are out there and this is a problem and I'm creating something that people actually want. It doesn't mean that they're going to buy what it is that you're, you're building, but it does mean that there is a market for it. And that's what you want to get to. You also can do things like just buying, creating a simple ad on Instagram or Twitter or even Google 
um, creating a very simple landing page, spending no more than $10 on it, and then running ads to see how many people click through that's on your particular topic. And because most platforms publish their click-through rates, you can then determine whether your click-through rates are below average or above average. If they're above average, that means that there's probably some interest in what you're doing. And so these are all little things you can do to sort of like test out your idea before you like tapped into your 401k, which I highly, highly, highly do not advise you do, yes. um, especially <laughs> now where the markets are. Do not do that. Please, please leave it alone um, to build your idea. Yeah, I love it. I oh, I just think it's such a smart process. I think too often we have this great idea, and I'm so guilty of this, you know, in business and in life, where I'm like, I've got this great idea, I'm going all in on it, and then you know, I wake up down the road and realize, oh, that that didn't work, and I yep. could have gotten an answer on that a lot faster if I'd you know um, validated it um, ahead of time. Yeah. How do you? How do you recommend people process negative feedback? Because I think sometimes we are really blinded by our by our love for our ugly baby mm-hmm. that we don't see how ugly the baby actually is. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, how do you recommend people take that feedback and actually hear it? Well, one, ask yourself who's saying it. Um, that that's a very important distinction in terms of feedback. It's one thing if it's an investor, like. I invest, you know, in a company and I own a percentage equity in it and I'm giving feedback. It's a very, very different context than someone who's just outside who has no investment in the company. And so for you as a founder, as an entrepreneur, like ask yourself, what what is this person's motive? What interest do they have in me? Is it if it's my personal advisory board, those are people who want me to sort of win. So if they're giving me feedback, maybe I need to listen a little bit. Yeah. Versus some rando on the internet, because there's so many people who have opinions now. Is that opinion really matter? Is that opinion something I should really hold dear? Um, And so I think that's really important to understand those two distinctions. Um, And then also, I think in terms of feedback, just use it as a data point. I'm um, not an endpoint. The same thing I say about failure. Use it as a data point, not an endpoint. So, what information can I glean from this comment or feedback? And is it information that is relevant to what I'm doing? And can I take it and implement it? Mm-hmm. And if you can't, then leave it right where it's at. Like, don't even fret yeah. with it. But if it's true yeah. feedback that you can use to help make your product better or make yourself better, then take yeah. that little nugget of wisdom and use it to move yourself forward. And think of it as it's helping you move forward. Not that it's a criticism of you personally. Yes, I love that. That's really helpful. I think to approach it maybe with a science, you know, the, using the word data point to help me think about like you, approaching it like a scientist, right? Like yep. it's not about it's not about you. It's not about your feelings, but to like kind of remove yourself from uh, from the situation, look at it from the outside, and view view it like a, a scientist would studying yep. something. And what does this data point say about the the, the direction and um, it's a really, yeah, really helpful metaphor there. You encourage uh, builders to, to uh, the word you use is act, act entitled and embrace mm-hmm. failure. <laughs> uh, and I want to just, yeah, just, just hear, hear you share a little bit about that, especially that the act entitled part, I think is, is really important. I think you have some, some, I mean, you've used that entitled word a bit throughout the book to share maybe the genesis of some of that yeah. and, you know, what you're kind of reacting and pushing against. And then also the invitation that you're, you're offering to people. Yeah. In that. It's interesting. And so in the 2016 election, I had a great friend call me who's a rich white dude of like all the network Stanford, like all the rich white dudeness. He's like the height of rich white dudeness. And he was so upset um, with the election and just kind of, you know, excuse my language, but like bitched a little bit. And I was like, okay, get five minutes, like five minutes, dude. <laughs> and I said to him, when after his five minutes was over, I said, you know, you have a birthright. People give you privilege and you don't even ask for it. And you can't even give it away. You walk into a store and people assume that you can afford to buy everything in there. I walk into the store and many times they assume I can't. That's not your fault. People get, they put that on you. They give that to you. They give you your privilege readily. And so use it. I mean, you, you have it. You're like Prince Harry. You can never not be a royal. You can never not have that privilege. You can never give it yeah. back. So use it. Use your entitledness. That is, that is your superpower, is that you're super entitled. So use it for others. Figure out how you can bring other people around. And I think this whole idea of entitled is that, again, 
you know, for rich white men, they are given privileges that they don't even deserve. Um, they're given privileges, whether they want it or not, is given to them. Our society is constructed to give them that. And for that reason, they don't have to really think about stuff. And it's interesting. My friend said to me, you know, I had never thought about the 99% of people who were behind me. All I knew is I wasn't Bill Gates. Yeah. So I wasn't true. Elon Musk. But I'm yes. like, dude, you're like a, a healthy millionaire. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> but, but in his mind, he was like, I'm not them. And I was yeah. only looking in forward. And I only was looking at the fact that I wasn't these like ultra, ultra high net worth people. I wasn't looking back and saying, oh my God, I'm richer than like almost everybody else. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's a very entitled way of thinking because the titles mm -hmm. don't have to look back. They don't have to yeah. think about that. They don't yeah. have to worry about whether or not they belong in a room because they belong everywhere. All rooms are constructed for their belonging. Yeah. And that's a big difference when you're not that, right? Mm -hmm. When you are a woman or you're a black woman and you show up into a room or you're an immigrant and maybe English isn't your first language and you show up into the room and you know this room is not constructed for you. So you have to think about how to build relationships, how to build your presence. And that's where the idea of builders come from is that we're always building, we're always creating because we don't have it created for us. We don't yes. have the building already constructed. We have to construct the yes. building. Um, and and how do we think about building companies or our lives or our careers in that context of that we have to build it. It's not constructed for us. Yes. Um, luckily for me in, in subsequent generations, um, I'm a, like a late Gen Xer, almost millennial. Um, we had people who gave us blueprints at least. Um, but I think of my parents and definitely my grandparents did not have any blueprints whatsoever. It was just like, go build something and like yeah. build a skyscraper, have fun. And you're like, well, how do I yeah. build a skyscraper? I don't know how to do that. Oh, and we're also going to tear down the skyscraper a couple of times in the middle of you building it too, so that you have to rebuild it. Um, and so luckily for us, I'm starting to see changes in builders, particularly millennial and Gen Z builders, where we have blueprints that have been made for us. Um, and then we have a couple of blocks actually have been given to us to get started. And so we're now starting to construct buildings that hopefully will last in the institutions and there are going to be models for other buildings to be built as builders. But, you know, I think it's just challenging. I think being, you know, um, a builder, particularly in a time when things are not good economically, which is where we're kind of heading towards. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see the interactions between the builders and entitles in the, in the upcoming years. Yeah. Yeah. And so is your encouragement to, to builders to maybe, um, I don't know, fake it till you make it. You don't use that word, but like when you walk into that room, yeah. like to act, act like you belong, um, you, to, to, yeah. like, what, what, I don't know, maybe you can even speak to the people in the audience who are, who are you're part of the, that demographic, like that they're going into that, that meeting with whether it's their boss or a VC and, they feel like they don't belong. Like, I don't know if you have specific words you yeah. want to just say to them right now, but I'd love to just, you know, open that. Yeah. A good friend of mine, um, I remember we were talking and she said, you know, you realize you're the coolest person they met that day. I was talking to her about meeting with some potential investors in our fund. She's like, you're the coolest person they met. Like I guarantee she said, I guarantee you were the coolest person they met that day. So show up as such. Yeah. And and so remember you, particularly when you are diverse, you are the coolest person they met that day, um, especially if you're in Silicon Valley land of like, you know, Patagonia vests and like khakis and all bird shoes. And you show up, <laughs> you are the coolest person they met that day. Um, yes, yes. And so and so present yourself as such show up into the rooms, understanding that and how mm. lucky they are to meet you in this day because oh, so man, good. their day would just be full of boring meetings with other Patagonian vests, but you <laughs> show up and you are just like a light and you're different and it's exciting. And so they should be excited to meet with you because you're yeah. bringing a whole new perspective and a whole new way of thinking to them. And wow, now their day just got more interesting and guarantee on their way home and their Tesla, they're going to be talking to whomever they talk to their partner, their wife, their husbands, about I met this really cool black woman that day. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so show up as such. Yeah. 
That's so great. What a fun reframing. I love it. It's really, yeah. And if you don't think you're the coolest, fake it. Like pretend like you are. Like, because they're not going to know. And one of the fun things I do is I have a a playlist on Spotify that I listen to. um, And it's called Bad, you know, (laughs) B-I-T-C-H. But it's like Uh Megan Thee Stallion. And and I listen to it before I go into some of these meetings where I know I'm going to be the only person like me. And it yep. just gets me like pumped up, like the confidence. You know, if you have Megan yes. Stallion in your head where you're talking to a pension mm. fund, like, yep. you know, <laughs> like you just feel like bad and like, yes. and, it, and, it, and it has an impact on how you show up with confidence yes. and presence. So whoever your hype person is, your yes. hype song, that's another way to get yourself hyped up before you go into some of these rooms. I love it. It's so it's it's I mean, both so practical, right? Like have a have a playlist. And also, I think it's just I don't know, aspirational. Like, yeah, this is this is possible, like to know that 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 you can tell yourself a different story about the spaces that you're in that allow you to then show up in in new ways. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, any, you know, just as we move toward, toward, towards wrapping up here, you know, best case scenario, if you have a, have a magic wand and all, all the, all your dreams come true for the people that read this book, like, what is, what does that look like? What's the impact that this book would have? It's that we're all creating and we're all building. And again, I think in a time where things are being destroyed, um, to have a community of people who are building and builders it's a truly wonderful thing for our world. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So well said. Thank you for this. And I'm, I'm so excited with what you're doing with the Genius Guild. And, um, you know, I imagine a future where, where like you were saying, like that, that our kids get to grow up in a space where more is possible for all, all people, you know, regardless yeah. of, of the genetics cards that they've been, they've been dealt and um, the culture cards that they've been dealt. And so um, thank you for the work that you're doing to, to move the needle on that. So thank you so uh, much. Yeah. For folks that want to connect with you, follow along with what you're doing, you know, any, anything that you'd like to invite them to? Yeah, please follow me on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. It's Catherine Finney. Um, and I just really hope people enjoy the book. Um, we're asking people, you know, buy the book for yourself, but also buy it for an entrepreneur in your life. Um, it's a fun book. It's, it's business, but it's fun. Um, it fun. And so, and so um, you know, give a book to one of the entrepreneurs in your life. And then when you do buy it and read it, like take a picture with it, because I always love to hear how people are using the book, how are they using lessons, maybe some things that you discovered that I didn't even think of. And so um, I look forward to seeing uh, all the pictures and photos and interacting with you all. I love it. Thank you so much for the book. Thank you for sharing with us today. It's been really great having you on the show. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Listeners, viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. You can find links to Catherine's work at themeaningmovement.com slash Catherine. That's spelled K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, themeaningmovement.com slash Catherine. While you're there, you'll find opt-in boxes all over the site where you can jump on to the newsletter. We're releasing a newsletter every week that's packed full of resources for you, bios of guests, links to interesting things that I've been enjoying, invites to the trainings that we're running on a monthly basis, and so much more. If you're not on the email list and you're missing a big part of what the Meaning Movement is doing and the free content that we're creating for you. So jump on that email list. Wherever you're watching, or listening, hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not aware we're on YouTube, go to youtube.com slash the meaning movement to find our channel there. Would love for you to subscribe. And if you're listening in audio format, wherever you're listening, there's a subscribe button, hit that subscribe button. If there's a place to leave a rating and review, take a moment and do so if you've gotten any value out of this or any, any of the shows. I've said this before, but when you search for a podcast the podcasts are ranked based on how popular 
they are and how well they fit with what you are looking for. But that ranking is weighted according to the number of reviews that you have. And I'm going up against a lot of resources, celebrities with massive followings, podcast houses like Gimlet and you know, NPR, all these all of these businesses, all of these companies that have a ton of resources that they're putting into producing podcasts with full teams behind them. This is a bootstrapped, self-funded, independent podcast, which means that it's me and it's my team. And we're paying for our way as we go. And if there's anything that you can do to help us, it is to jump on our newsletter, leave a rating and review wherever you get this. That helps us just immensely find more listeners like yourself to benefit from the content we're creating. So thank you in advance for considering. Our music is by Tom Murham. Our artwork is by Eliezer Ruiz. We'll be back with you in just a couple of days. <laughs>